State Representative Dave Maturin of the 63rd District. Dave, good to see you today. Same here. Good morning. The uh, 63rd, we have to remind some people who don't keep tabs on such things. It's uh, all sort of an arc that goes uh, uh, around the kind of the bottom and sides of Calhoun County, I guess you could say, and gets over to Kalamazoo. Yeah, it's the east half of Kalamazoo County and kind of the south central two-thirds of uh, Calhoun. So. Okay. And then the 62nd comprises the rest of Calhoun and some portions north. Right. That's Battle Creek north of the county line over to the east and, and down to Albion. So. Yep. So right now it's uh, Dr. John Bison, who's the 62nd state representative, and he will be vacating that to run for the state senate. Right. And uh, you're in the 63rd getting uh, ready to run for another term. That's correct, yep. One more term. One more. Term limits. Now, wanted to talk about, uh, and somebody brought this up the other day, you know. Hey, we still haven't done anything on auto insurance reform. I mean, this has been a tough one to reach consensus on. Well, it is. And, and like everything else in, in Lansing, the devil's in the details. Um, I voted against the uh, the package that was up last year, about a year ago. Um, I don't think it was a good package of legislation for my constituents. Uh, when I took a look at the uh, at one of the tools that's used to rate uh, personal injury protection on a unit by unit of, of government ratio, the, the folks in my district got anywhere from an eight percent to a fifty two percent discount off the average state rate. So I asked the proponents, I said, well, the person that's, that lives in the township that's getting a 52%, you promised them another 40 so they're going to get a 92% discount, right? Hmm. And they, they said, well, no. I said, that, I think you're right. It's no, because this plan was written by the mayor of Detroit, where they pay exorbitant uh, rates. They're 125 to 275% of the base rate. And it's and the mayor of Detroit and the insurance company. So it wasn't going to cause any great rate reduction for the folks in my district. Plus, they had a plan out there, a $250,000 plan, which sounded like it was pretty good, but 225000 of that was only for emergency room. So my auto accident I had about a year ago cost about $100,000 to get me out of the emergency room in a couple days in the hospital. I left $125,000 on the table I couldn't use for anything, and the other 25000 had to last for the entire rest of the hospital stay, all my rehabilitation, all the rental of all the equipment I needed, didn't come anywhere near paying for it. So... 250 sounded pretty good, but I left 125 on the table. And, and most people would leave a lot more than that on the table. So it really wasn't $250,000 coverage. It was 25000 So we get less coverage without the rate reduction. I'm looking for something better than that. I'll vote for anything that has the ability to lower rates for my constituents. Do you think sometimes there's pressure to pass a bill through so it looks like we're Passing a bill through. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. How, how could anybody vote against uh, no-fault reform? Well, if it's true reform, that's one thing. But this wasn't yeah. true reform. It wasn't true reform for my constituents anyway. But we need this victory so we can <laughs> show that we did this, so that we reduce taxes. Yeah, well, that's it. it all talk is cheap. Let me put it that way. Yeah, it so, talk's real cheap. Like you said, the devil's in the details. And uh, maybe you could say, yeah, yeah, massive reform. Uh, but but it, was it a fair and equitable reform? Right. Well, there, there are things out there that, that we could do. There's uh, still, there's about a dozen bills sitting in insurance committee. They've been there for a year. Uh, things like uh, uh, fraud authority, which we desperately need a fraud authority. There isn't one. Uh, attendant care reform. Um, uh, opening up the catastrophic claims. So there's $20 billion sitting in that, in that entity controlled by the insurance companies. And we can't look inside it to see what their actuarial uh, considerations are. We, we can't look inside it. In fact, the went to court and the court said, no, that's a private entity. So you and I pay $170 per year per vehicle per state law so we can drive our cars on the, on the public road, yet we give our money to a private entity and we can't open up the books. Mm -hmm. So that's something else that needs to be done. I think the Senate has passed some stuff just recently, just before we broke. Uh, maybe interesting to take a look at, see where they get with that. Uh, but we've we got legislation sitting, sitting there right now that can help reduce rates and do it in a reasonable way and, and something that's going to benefit my people. Well, and when you say sitting there right now, do you mean um, in committee and not being taken up by leadership? Right. There are, there are the bills that are introduced, and they're, they've been introduced and sitting in the committee, and it's up to the leadership to decide to take those bills up. Um, I mentioned before that, you know, the, 
uh, the, the folks that, that are committee chairs and, and leadership, they pretty much control the way the legislation goes. So, so I would hope that perhaps when we get back from our break that they take a look at it and say, hey, let's accomplish something this session, the 99th session of the legislature. Let's do something and start chipping away at these high rates for everybody. A plan to uh, streamline the approval process for farmers who use irrigation to grow crops uh, recently approved by the legislature, uh, waiting the governor's signature. Uh, you were involved in this. Explain that a little bit. Well, right now we've uh, actually it goes back to well, the early 2000s when we had a Great Lakes Compact, and each state is supposed to take care of its, its water withdrawal within its boundary, not only the Great Lakes, but its rivers and streams and the, and the groundwater. Um, so right now, I mean, irrigation is... Very, 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 very prevalent, very, very heavy in, in southwest Michigan. Everywhere you go, you see center pivot systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a method by which folks can apply for a permit to withdraw water. Most of them are fairly perfunctory, probably two-thirds of them. It's just a matter of just sending in a notice, and, and, and you get the permit, and everything's fine. Uh, but for some areas of the, of the, of the, of the state, um, it takes more of an, an in-depth analysis. And what we did, and I'm on the Natural Resources Committee, and actually one of, I had an amendment to the bill. It was, a, it was Miller's water withdrawal bill, uh, just to make sure that the people that are doing the testing on the ground, they submit that information to, to the state of Michigan. And up there, then they do the analysis. But m my amendment made sure that these people are at least members of a professional association, so we got some guarantee that they know what they're doing. And, and so I, I think that helped uh, assuage some people's concerns over the fact that we're just going to get somebody out there with minimal experience, not really knowing what to do, and then submitting the information to the state. Uh, I think it's a more scientific uh, way of looking at it, and um, the, the state has a certain amount of time to turn it around, about 20 days, and when you, if you're sitting there and you're and all of a sudden your well went dry and it's growing season, you can't wait around for six months. Um, so the, the DEQ does have the ability to turn things down and ask for more information, but I think it's a more scientific a more rapid process, and I think it helps producers out there, folks that really need to get the water on when they need to. So certainly something that I supported the Natural Resources Sources Committee and voted on the floor. And as we saw this weekend, uh, when they want to, the DEQ can get on their high horse and move pretty well for a bureaucratic government organization. Uh, <laughs> they tested the, the wells here in Battle Creek to see if uh, this manganese problem w was uh, prevalent in drinking water, and uh, the conclusion is no. Um, we got some manganese and some fire hydrants and some wells right. that uh, don't serve the public's uh, drinking needs, and uh, so we think we're okay there. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a human health versus a general, you know, uh, production water withdrawal issue, but, uh, but they... Hopefully, they, they can sp certainly realize when, when it's a human health need, they really got to get it on the sticks. Yeah. State Representative Dave Maturin is our guest from the 63rd District. Uh, also wanted to talk about uh, some uh, legislation to improve the property tax assessment process for homeowners and other landowners. Um, House Bill 6049, what's that about? Well, this was a bill that was written by the Treasury Department uh, dealing with some supposed reforms to the assessment process. And um, it's a fairly lengthy bill. It's a technical bill. I, I found it in interesting that I'm the only former uh, assessor in the House of Representatives and nobody talked to me about the bill. Oh. Um, so we're kind of reacting to it. I know there's... Uh, a lot of folks are worried about the loss of local control, about the increased cost uh, to essentially create more of a, of a countywide assessing uh, jurisdiction for lots and lots of units of government. Um, and so there's some real concern from the townships and the municipal league and the counties as to is this the correct direction to go. You know, it's interesting that, that about 95% of the properties on, on any given year are, are kind of on autopilot. In other words, people look at their taxable value. That's what they pay taxes on. We have a property tax based upon taxable value. We did that in 1994. And, and so the taxable value is really the key. And for 90%, 95% of the people, that doesn't change from year to year. Um, they're kind of on auto, autopilot. So I'm not really quite sure what the problem is they're trying to fix. I'm, I'm sure there are some folks out there that aren't doing a good job. But as the state treasurer said, most assessors are doing a good job. Well... To me, maybe we need to hone in and, and fix the issue for the ones that aren't doing a good job and 
kind of let everybody else who is doing a good job continue on. So major concerns about, again, increased cost, about uh, local loss of local control, and in fact, the, you know, the local assessors are the people that live in the communities. They know what's going on. So. So right now, every township has an assessor. Sometimes it's the township supervisor, but more and more it seems like it's a, uh, a paid assessor that, that does that uh, on the side. Well, and there are 300 folks, and this, this law would outlaw uh, elected officials being the assessors. So there's 300 folks in the state of Michigan that are also elected supervisor and also assessor. And I guess I'd like to see, are they really doing a bad job? Uh, if they are, but just they've basically taken those 300 people and said, you can't do both jobs. you got to go out and hire an outside assessor. So I'm not sure if that's good or not. Uh, and if they're doing a good job, why do we want to stop them from doing it? They certainly know the local community just as well as, as somebody who's going to drive 50 miles to come in, you know, two hours every two weeks to put some numbers mm -hmm. down. So, so this bill might uh, eliminate uh, assessors and townships and put it in the hands of the county? It could be. They've got criteria based upon uh, so many tax dollars raised and so many parcels raised, uh, so many parcels under jurisdiction. And if you don't meet that threshold, then you lose the ability to do you know, your assessing locally and you've got to you know, contract with somebody or, or have the county do it for you. Hmm. So in, in the counties around here, they have uh, folks that are level four assessors just because of the, the, the population and the mix of a commercial and industrial. But, you know, we got a lot of counties up north that, you know, they're pretty much rural, residential, recreational. Uh, those people would then end up having to pay more to find somebody at this highest level that's going to be necessary per this law. So they're working on it over the summer. Uh, I've got some major concerns with it, um, certainly in favor of, of good uh, good assessing practices, but I kept hearing the word equity, equity, uniformity, and I said, we threw equity, I said, if you if you would have come back in 1993 and talked to me about this, that'd be one thing, but we, in 1994, we traded equity and uniformity for certainty. I mean, you look around, just look around your neighbors and see what their house looks like and what they're paying in taxable value. They're all over the board. Uh, so there isn't really any equity in our property tax system, and we did it through the Constitution. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Keep us posted on that. Um, your uh, real estate transfer tax fairness measure was signed into law by the governor. Very happy about that. Um, essentially, I, I think it's very offensive if you if you actually end up losing um, money on your most precious asset, your home, and then the state comes in and says, oh, but by the way, you still owe us uh, three quarters of 1% of the sale price in a real estate transfer tax. So to mm -hmm. me, it's adding insult to injury. You've just lost money on your most valuable asset, and now you got to pay a tax for the privilege of doing it. What this does is, is add to a bill I passed last session, and essentially if you buy a lot, build a home, and then because of the economy, you end up selling it for less than that, you don't have to pay a tax, and I just think that's fair. Mm-hmm. We'll leave it right there. We'll uh, have you in again uh, next month. Give us another update, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully there'll be something to update uh, throughout the summer, um, especially on this auto tax reform, and we'll keep an eye on this uh, assessing uh, bill as it gets worked on and hammered out. Representative Dave Maturin, 63rd District, our guest here on the WBCK Morning Show. My pleasure.